Well, thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be here at uh, JCDCGGG. I wish I could be there in person. Uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, puzzle fonts um, and their use in, in making sculpture, like the one you see here. Um, and uh, the motivation here is that we use fonts every day to express our mathematics. Um, you know, to write down formulas and things like this. This is a font that Knuth uh, co-created uh, based on the handwriting of Euler. Uh, but what I'm interested in is using fonts to where the font itself expresses the mathematics and maybe even reading the text in the font requires you to engage in the mathematics. Uh, so I'm going to define a math font, a mathematical font, to be some font that uses a mathematical theorem or open problem, um, and a puzzle font to be a font where reading the text itself requires you to solve a mathematical puzzle. And the motivation here is it's a way for us to uh, share our beautiful mathematics with the world, uh, not just with mathematicians, but everyone, you know, most people can read. Um, and so... Uh, by reading in these funny kinds of fonts. Um, if you like puzzles, you can learn about mathematics. Uh, for example, this font at the bottom, uh, you take each of these square pieces of paper, you fold along the blue and green lines and cut along the red line, and you get uh, IJCDCGGG. Um, now, if you've been in the JCDCGGG world for a while, you may recall I already gave a talk about this topic back in 2016. Um, back then, we had uh, several fonts, but it was sort of the early days of this work. Um, and in 2019, uh, I gave a talk about origami, and the number of fonts had grown a little bit. Um, and in particular, uh, I shared this um, physical object um, with uh, a font illustration. So on the left here is a crease pattern. You fold all the blue and the the green, sorry, blue and uh, red lines, and there's these little gray regions. When you fold it, you get the 3D structure of Akiyama Jin, and the images all come together to make a photograph of him. Uh, so that's an example of some older font work. Uh, but uh, our fonts have been exploding. Um, we've made uh, many over the last few years, and what I wanted to share with you is some of these new fonts and exciting developments. Um, all of these fonts I'll be talking about are on the web. You can go to uh, my webpage to play with them. Uh, they were recently featured in the New York Times as well, which is exciting. Uh, so um, this uh, sculpture on the cover slide here um, is a recent piece we made just this year, and it features a lot of our fonts, or two fonts of ours uh, in the printed pattern. And so I wanted to talk about those fonts, and then I'll talk about the sculpture. Uh, so this first font is an animated font. This is something fun you can do on a computer, not in printed text. And you may recognize this as the game of Tetris. Uh, so this is the Tetris font. Um, here are all the letters. Um, each letter is made out of exactly one copy of each of the seven Tetris pieces. And they're designed, uh, the letters are designed so that you can do this falling animation. Each piece can be placed uh, while resting on the floor or one of the previous pieces. So they stack up according to Tetris gravity. This is a challenging constraint along with the tiling constraint of the shape and looking like letters. Um, there are many ways to express or to use this font to express letters. Here's a fun uh, kind of puzzle font where uh, now there's no rotations. You just drop all the pieces and imagine what it will say. Uh, but it's not so obvious until you do it. So in this case, it says puzzle font. Um, and another kind of puzzle font is very easy to read, uh, but uh, leads to a nice mathematical puzzle, which is uh, each of these letters can be packed by exactly one of each of the seven Tetris pieces. Can you figure out how? Um, and it's a challenging packing problem. Uh, so challenging, in fact, that we often use software to help solve it. This is uh, free software available uh, online called Burr Tools. You give an approximate shape you'd like to make. Um, and it will find, in this case, uh, 45,092 different ways to pack that shape with the seven Tetris pieces. Um, we look through, not all of them, but some of them, and find our favorite, and do some manual human tweaks to make it look like, in this case, a zero. 
Um, so we did that for all the pieces. In general, uh, tiling a shape with uh, even trominoes, three uh, square pieces is MP complete as proved by Horiyama-san and et al. Um, and also with an I tetromino, although I think the other tetrominoes we don't technically know NP hardness, presumably they are NP hard. Um, okay, so that was the first font, uh, Tetris font. Second font is a dissection font. Um, and this comes from Knuth, uh, who wrote this email to us uh, some years ago. Uh, he was working on The Art of Computer Programming, Volume 4B, Part 2. Um, and in a draft of the book, he had a couple of exercises that he thought uh, we would enjoy. They're font design exercises. Um, one of them, these are his solutions <laughs> to this exercise, because of course he has solutions for all of his exercises. Uh, this is a four-piece dissection font. Each of these letters, uh, according to the color coding, can be rearranged to make a square, I think a six by six square. Um, the pieces are not necessarily disconnected. You can see maybe in the K, uh, the regions, each color class is not a connected piece, but they move together and can form a square. Uh, the second puzzle is was to use connected pieces and only three pieces to make a six by six square. Uh, so this seemed like a challenge for us to do two pieces. Uh, it turns out with two pieces, uh, connected is quite difficult. Uh, these are all designed by hand, so different letters of the alphabet, and you can see how they rearrange into uh, six by six square. Um, this is with Yushi Uno. And with disconnected pieces, we can do a little better. Uh, here we get all the letters the same height, which is quite nice from a font design perspective. Uh, some of the letters look a little funny, but it's pretty readable. Um, and for the disconnected two-piece dissection, we actually had an algorithm for doing this uh, that we developed with Joe Rourke and his student Irina Pashenko uh, way back in 2000. We never wrote it up, but uh, it works. We implemented it um, and uh, made a solver so that we could interactively convert, uh, play with the polyomino until it's possible to convert one into another uh, with two pieces. This, for example, is JACE to C for JCDCGGG. Um, yeah, so these are the two fonts that are in this sculpture, um, mostly in the printed texture on the pieces of paper. So let me zoom into the printed texture. On one side, we have a bunch of problems. These are, um, in some cases, solved problems, and in the ones that are rotated are unsolved problems, uh, all about dissection and tiling. Uh, so in the theme of the Tetris and dissection fonts, uh, let me highlight a couple of them. Uh, this first one is show that two complete sets of the seven Tetris pieces cannot make this shape that you see on the projector, um, which is kind of funny because if you count the shapes here, there's exactly two T's and there's exactly two I's and there's two S's and it seems like everything, this actually is a tiling of this shape. This was an important shape for us because when we fold uh, concentric circles, we use this kind of annulus shape of paper. So uh, we we're very happy to find this tiling, uh, but then it turns out it doesn't actually exist. Um, there's a cheat in this tiling, which is there are uh, three of one type of L and one of the other type of L. Uh, so uh, it's a funny contradiction where we have a nice tiling, but it's not actually using each of the seven Tetris pieces twice. So that's a nice puzzle. Um, an unsolved problem in this space is, is, is it even decidable whether two polygons have a two-piece dissection. Every two polygons have an n-piece dissection for a large enough n, but for two pieces, we don't even know whether there is an algorithm, let alone an efficient one. Uh, for polyominoes, it's easy, but for polygons, not so easy. Um, on the other side of the piece of paper, we have the fonts. So um, the, the solved problems were all written in the Tetris font, and the unsolved problems were all written in the dissection font, and each of the letters uh, in the writing and shown large on this side are puzzles for the uh, students to solve. I forgot to mention this was presented at the International Math Olympiad uh, this summer uh, in Japan, and uh, so uh, students could uh, figure out how to uh, tile this shape with the seven Tetris pieces or how to cut up this shape into two sets that can uh, rearrange into a six by six square. Um, this is what it looked like at the IMO. Sadly, we couldn't be there, but you got to play with uh, Tetris pieces and try to assemble them into uh, our fonts. Uh, 
So that was a fun recent example of using fonts to make sculpture. Um, our most recent font uh, is an integer sequence font. So this is a way to write letters and numbers uh, with a, a, an integer, a sequence of integers here, one, three, five, seven, nine, that corresponds to here, one, three, five, seven, nine, and so on. So every uh, X coordinate here, we provide one Y coordinate that gives you a letter. And because they're written in this kind of italicized way, you can just write one letter after another and they separate. Uh, another way to say this is this is a function with a value at every integer. And uh, what's quite fun is when you actually plot the function here, the text becomes completely unreadable. So this still says A, B, C, D, E, uh, but it's pretty hard to see, especially if you erase the dots and just thicken the line. Now uh, it's uh, a fun puzzle. If you just take the vertices of this poly polygon, you get uh, letters of the alphabet. Uh, the original motivation for making this font is that we could um, make a sequence that plots itself. So this is a sequence, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, 17, 19. That describes this one here. Uh, then a zero and a one, that's the comma. And then a negative five, negative five, you see over here, that's these little dots for a separator after the comma. Um, and then uh, there's the digits for three, which are four, two, one, 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 uh, and so on. So this is kind of a fun infinite sequence that plots itself. Um, it was in the online encyclopedia for integer sequences, a great resource. Uh, for a couple of years, it was a sequence uh, here, and then later it was decided it's inappropriate for the OEIS. So uh, it, maybe many of you already have a sequence in the OEIS, but I'm one of the few people that has a rejected sequence from the OEIS because it wasn't uh, serious enough. <laughs> All right. Uh, so um, next I'm going to show you a bunch of fonts that are designed around folding as a general theme, because I do a lot of computational origami. Uh, I'm not going to show you all of these, but, um, but many of them. So one of the recent folding fonts is what we call an everything font, and this is a way to fold any letter of the alphabet into any other letter of the alphabet. So here we have hello into world. For example, and uh, you know, usually when we design a font, we design 26 different letters, uh, maybe 10 digits, uh, and that's not so bad. Uh, here, the worry was is that we would have to design 26 squared different letters. For every pair of letters, we need to figure out a folding from one to the other. Uh, but fortunately, we know mathematics comes to the rescue. We have a nice technique for going from anywhere to anywhere, which is to go from anywhere to some common intermediate state, and then from that common intermediate state to anywhere. And so we chose the letter E uh, for Eric. No, the letter E for everything. It's also a very nice letter from an origami perspective. It's got lots of long, thin segments. Um, and we showed how to fold any letter into the letter E and the letter E into anything. Uh, so for example, here is a graph into games for two of the Gs in JCDCGGG. Um, and we just compose these foldings from uh, each letter to the E and to uh, the letter we're going to. Here, G to G is not that exciting, but they are two different Gs. And for fun, why don't I show you um, also what these look like? Oh, I forgot to show you. Uh, here is, for example, the Tetris font. You can just type in your favorite message and uh, have it assemble into uh, that thing. Uh, let's go to everything font. Let's say uh, Japan to uh, Bali is what comes to mind. Um, so here you can fold Japan to Bali uh, with, and more impressive is if you hide the intermediate state, then it's not at all clear how you came up with that folding. Okay, uh, fold and cut font. So this is uh, what I showed you at the very beginning, a way to take a square piece of paper, fold along uh, a sequence of simple folds, make one straight cut, and produce uh, a letter of the alphabet here, the letter F. Uh, and this, of course, refers to the fold and cut theorem, which uh, was first published at JCDCG, my very first, in 1998, uh, when I was 17 years old, good old days, um, that you can take a piece of paper, fold it flat, make one straight cut, and get any set of polygons you like. Um, but it, it actually uses a, a different version of the fold and one cut theorem, which is simple fold and cut. 
uh, developed with Hiroito and others, uh, where you only are allowed simple folds. And here, not everything is possible. In particular, the very first fold needs to be a line of symmetry, but we characterize algorithmically what is possible and use that to design the font uh, together with uh, Steckles here, uh, who's a math YouTuber and got interested in making letters of the alphabet with fold and cut. Uh, here's a different kind of fold and cut is fold and punch. Uh, this was a, a previous JCDCG, I think three G's at that point. I uh, have to check. Um, oh no, I think this was in Dalian actually, 2000, 2016. Uh, so this is a consequence of fold and cut is you can fold a piece of paper flat and punch a hole and make any pattern of holes you want. Uh, but you can solve that problem more efficiently than fold in one cut. And so we had some nice algorithms for doing that, and we made a font to illustrate, even with simple folds, you can make some pretty neat patterns of cuts. Um, and the latest one is from JCDCGGG uh, last year, uh, orthogonal folding cut. Here all the folds are uh, orthogonal, horizontal or vertical, or perpendicular to each other. Um, and uh, here if I erase the letters, you can see that more clearly. Um, I thought I would tell you that algorithm because it's a it's a kind of new and and very simple algorithm. So here the problem is we have we're only allowed let's say we have an axis aligned rectangle we're only allowed to fold horizontal and vertical, um, and the cuts uh, we're only allowed to make one cut, but that cut doesn't have to be horizontal or vertical. So it's orthogonal folds but not orthogonal cut, um, and you can show uh, that all the cuts have to have the same angle up to reflection. Um, and so that actually divides your space into these uh, vertical bands. Also, there's horizontal bands, but um, where uh, you clearly cannot fold through here vertically because that would uh, mess up the uh, cut locally. So we say creases are banned from the bands. You're not allowed to have them in there. Uh, so you put cuts in, you put the creases in between. And it turns out if you just put the creases at the bisectors in those strips, um, if any crease pattern is going to work, that crease pattern will work. Uh, and you can actually do it alternating mountains and valleys. So this is a very simple algorithm. It doesn't always work. Not everything is possible. Uh, but if anything will work, this, this tells you how to do it. And you can easily check. Uh, next kind of folding problem is uh, what are called impossible hypercards. Uh, this is a type of impossible object, kind of magic trick, uh, where you take a rectangle of paper, uh, you cut it um, and do some folding, and you and you produce an object that looks like it can't have been made from a single sheet of paper, but it can be made. You should try it out. It's a lot of fun. It looks especially impressive from a playing card. Uh, here's a variation uh, by uh, Ruhe Orohara. Uh, that's even looks even crazier. How do these two flaps of paper come out of the card? Uh, but it's all just made from cutting and folding the card. So we wanted to make a whole bunch of impossible cards, uh, one for each letter of the alphabet. Here they are. Um, and here is an animation of one of them folding. This is letter J for Japan. Uh, and it's folded, it's cut and folded from a square. Cool. Um, okay, that was a lot of complicated folding. Let's do some very simple folding. How about one fold? Uh, so here, imagine a, a strip of paper, a rectangle of paper uh, that's a bit semi-transparent, and you fold along one vertical line, and uh, you take what doesn't look like letters uh, become letters. And so here, you can, as these are folding, you can try to predict what it's going to say. This is some very simple text. Uh, and this is a self-describing uh, artwork. It says, fold this in half, which is instructions for how to fold it. Of course, before you fold it in half, you don't know what the instructions are. Uh, so a, f a bit of a joke here. Only after you've solved it do you know what you're supposed to do. Uh, but it, you confirm that it folded it right. Uh, speaking of one fold, if you take one curved crease, you can do some pretty crazy things. Uh, on the right here, you see the C-Cell logo being folded from a long uh, curved strip of paper. Uh, maybe more impressive is this one, uh, non-self-intersecting strip of material that when you, if you fold along that central crease, it becomes Picasso's dancer. 
um, and this is part of a, a mathematical and computational design system uh, with uh, Clara Mandelova um, to make anything you want. Um, and here in particular, we can make uh, cursive letters of the alphabet. Here you see the folding of a capital B. Uh, and they're, this is what they look like unfolded, uh, which is pretty fun. They are uh, unintelligible. All right, uh, fixed angle linkages. Uh, we heard mention of protein folding, so uh, here's some protein folding. Um, if you look at proteins or DNA, uh, you have angles between bonds are relatively constant. And one of the things we're interested in is flattening these uh, 3D linkages without changing those angles. Um, and so we built designed a font around this, uh, which you may have seen, it's, it's quite old, but there's a new theorem about it, so I wanted to mention. So here we have uh, the name of the conference. Um, and each of these is a linkage where the angles are fixed. Here in the G, they're all equal at 120, except for this one, which is 60. And you can see all the different foldings of that letter G. Uh, there, there are many of them, general, exponential. Um, and given one of these linkages, like this guy, uh, it's a puzzle to figure out what letter of the alphabet it folds into. Um, they're each different, so it turns out this can only fold into a letter D, no other letters of the alphabet. Um, and there's a new theorem about this topic, fixed angle chains. So uh, here's a very s classic theorem. This is not new. Uh, if you take a 90 degree open chain, uh, you can always flatten it with a zigzag pattern. But what about a closed chain? Turns out that makes the problem NP hard. Deciding whether a closed chain with ver links of varying lengths can be folded flat is NP hard. This is possibly the most complicated hardness uh, figure I've ever drawn. Uh, this is with uh, Jason Lynch and Hiroito and uh, Ruhei Urahara um, just last year. Um, crazy three sat reduction. Uh, finally uh, solving a problem from 11 years earlier. So that's quite exciting. So fonts lead to new theorems also. <laughs> uh, let's move on to puzzles and games. Uh, going for the other G here. Uh, so uh, we really like puzzles, and we design a lot of fonts around them. Usually when there's a theorem about a puzzle, we like to make a font in the this, in this style of that puzzle. So here is one of the most famous puzzles, pencil and, pencil and paper puzzle, Sudoku. Uh, if you solve each of these puzzles, they're actually quite easy. Uh, very simple rules will solve them. And then you connect all the adjacent ones and twos, twos and threes, threes and fours, the consecutive numbers, and then take the longest path in that graph, you get... Uh, that was the letters Sudoku. So let's go through it one more time. We connect consecutive digits, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then take the longest path in that graph, we get Sudoku. Um, and uh, here is a complete alphabet. So in this case, by hand, we designed uh, these sequences of digits, like here you see six, seven, eight, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Uh, these are actually quite difficult to design so that they don't already violate uh, the solution to a Sudoku puzzle. Then we wrote a, a computer program, a Sudoku solver, that filled in all the other digits uh, and then removed the digits to uh, make a uniquely solvable puzzle uh, such that it still leads to uh, the desired longest path. Um, and we actually generated 81 versions of each letter. So these are different puzzles. They look quite different. And they solve to different things but the uh, longest path is the same. And it's always this uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. Uh, so if you look at the six different variations here, they will all have the same digits in those positions, but different digits in other positions, all randomly generated. And we take uh, longest path to make sure it still makes the letter S there. All right, so that was Sudoku. Sudoku is NP hard, as you probably know, an old result. Uh, Tatami Bari is a very old, uh, also a Nikol Nikoli uh, puzzle, famous uh, Japanese puzzle publisher. Uh, so here you're given a square grid with these clues that are dashes, vertical bars, or plus signs. Your goal is to decompose that grid into rectangles, where uh, one per clue, where the, uh, the vertical bars make rectangles that are taller than they are wide, the horizontal bars make rectangles that are wider than they are tall, and the plus signs make squares. So this is a nice puzzle, actually quite difficult to prove hard. It took us years. Uh, finally, we solved it in 2020, 
this is with uh, Jason Lynch and others. Um, and uh, we actually, I think, could not have designed this hardness proof by hand correctly, uh, or it would have been very, very difficult. Every time we came up with a clause uh, in the SAT proof, uh, we found a mistake in it. And it was thanks to a SAT solver. We, we wrote a program that converted Tatami Bari into a SAT problem and applied modern SAT techniques. This is the very first clause we designed. And then you can see this is a sequence of, I think, 21 different clause gadgets until the last one is the one that actually worked. Um, and we could verify that by trying all the possibilities and seeing whether it solved exactly the way we wanted it to. Um, and then we made a font around that. So these are uh, the puzzles we designed uh, by hand, but using the SAT solver, we could keep tweaking the puzzle until the SAT solver said, yes, the solution is unique and it's the letters uh, that you want. Uh, so here we changed the problem a little bit by having um, dark clues and light clues so that you can actually uh, make a 2D pattern. It's common in a lot of other puzzles, but I don't think it's been done in Tatami Bari before. All right, and here's a little message, uh, which I'm sure you can all solve. Uh, it says, NP hard. Um, and when you play with these puzzles uh, on the website, let me jump to Tatami Bari, you actually get a little solving interface. So you can actually try to solve this puzzle. Um, I'm just fooling around here, making some rectangular regions, probably not getting it right. Uh, but you can, you can actually try to solve it. If you solve it, it will congratulate you, uh, or you can cheat and look at the answer. Um, all right, next puzzle is Yin Yang. This is uh, an even older pencil and paper puzzle from 1994 uh, from this uh, journal, uh, Puzzle in Japan, um, or magazine. Uh, so here you're given a square grid and some white uh, dots and some black dots, and you would like to fill in all of the blank spaces, white and black, so that the white region forms a connected tree and the black region forms a connected tree surprisingly difficult uh, and turns out to be NP hard. Uh, also without the tree constraint. So here uh, the problem was just to fill in some little regions um, in a way that black and white are connected, which is sort of a natural partitioning problem. And a little more complicated is uh, if you want the tree version. Um, this is uh, also with uh, Jason Lynch and Yushi Uno probably here. Uh, and we made a font too. Uh, this is a bit of a tricky, uh, to make a tree shaped font was a little bit interesting. Um, and then we wrote a computer program to, so we designed these fonts by hand with, you know, nice interlocking trees of white and black. Um, then we wrote a computer program to try to find hard to solve puzzles that uniquely solve into those letters. Um, and here I have a little excerpt of the program. So it would randomly take clues away and then try to solve the puzzle to see if it was still unique and stop when it got to something unique. And we ran that random generation many, many times. Um, and then this is a, the display that you get. These are various, uh, various uh, puzzles that solve to this B. Um, and we measure them according to various parameters, like how many clues did they have to have uh, how much branching did the search do when it was trying to find that there's a unique solution? And then by hand, we would choose the ones that we thought looked nice, but that they were hard to solve, required a lot of branching, had a few clues, and didn't look like the letter, so it wouldn't reveal the answer. So then you can take uh, you could take individual letters, and we could also uh, do much larger puzzles. This one takes several minutes for the computer to minimize, uh, but it's still not too, very obvious what it says. Uh, if you solve it, uh, and if you stand back uh, from a distance, it says connects dots, which is sort of describing how yin yang works. You want to connect all the dots together. Uh, and let's see, how's my time? Yeah, so uh, last puzzle I want to describe is an old one. Um, it's a sliding coin puzzle. Um, Gardner popularized this type of puzzle where you can take a coin and move it to a position uh, adjacent to two others and you want to minimize the number of moves to get from one shape to another. Um, this is one of our oldest papers was on this topic in the year 2000. Uh, and we, uh, you know, most puzzles are NP hard 
or worse. Um, but this puzzle actually has a polynomial time algorithm, both on the triangular grid and on square grid. Not for minimizing the number of moves, that's probably NP hard, but for solve knowing whether a puzzle is solvable, you can do it in polynomial time. There's a nice algorithm. But I think what makes these puzzles interesting for humans is that it's still not that easy because you need a cubic number of moves. So it is polynomial, but it's a big polynomial. Um, and this really helps us with puzzle design because there's a very simple uh, necessary and sufficient condition for puzzles to be solvable, say on the square grid. And we can use that to design a whole range of puzzles. So here we have 36 um, different puzzles, the letters, the alphabet, and digits. Um, and every pair of them is a puzzle. Can How do you go from an A to a B? How do you go from a B to a C? How do I go from a C to an A? How do I go from an A to an E? All, all of these are puzzles and you can, uh, solve them. I think there's even an Android app for this. Uh, you know, here's A to B. You, you can drag these coins, move them into a position that uh, is adjacent to at least two others. Here I've made this puzzle unsolvable. It's no longer possible to get from A to B because I can't get outside the bounding box. Um, and I've used four moves so far. And there's a high score chart uh, where various people uh, since 2018 have competed for the fewest moves here. You can see one I did was 22, uh, but it turns out the optimal solution for this puzzle is 17. And we thought it would be really cool to have um, you know, a big high score board for all of these different puzzles uh, and you know, the world could compete to find the best solutions. Uh, but then it turns out one person wrote a program that brute forced all of the puzzles. So now we actually know the optimal solution for every puzzle, but you can try to find it uh, by uh, playing around here and add your, you can still add your name to the high score table. It'll just be a tie. Um, five by seven seemed pretty good, uh, but we that wasn't enough puzzles, so we also did a five by nine font, so it's another 2,600 puzzles, which you can play with. All right, uh, so that's it for puzzles. The last topic I wanted to share with you is uh, using fonts to generate art. Um, so uh, there's lots of work on algorithmic art. You can think of algorithmic art as just some algorithm, some process that given a random seed of data produces a cool diagram. Here we see cellular automata, which are pretty cool looking. Um, and you can also think of a font like this, right? You input some text into your word processor. Uh, you, you via a font, you get some images. I'm not sure I would call these art, but they're kind of neat. Uh, but if we take a weird font, like the ones I've been describing, an artistic font, and you plug in some text, you can generate some cool images that have the text in them, it just may not be obvious. So uh, here I will reveal the more than words hiding in those uh, tilings, uh, but you don't necessarily see them. And that can be fun, because uh, the text is there, but it's hidden. So the example I'm going to use is the Vorna diagram. I think you all know how the Vorna diagram works. Uh, it occurs a lot in nature, uh, in the stars in the galaxy, uh, in uh, you know, stripes and patterns on animals. Uh, and humans have used Vorna diagrams to make lots of art already. Uh, but we'd like to use it to make text art. So here are points in a Vorna diagram designed uh, so that the Voronoi diagram, Voronoi diagram makes uh, a letter J here. Um, and if you erase the dots, uh, you get the letters. On the other hand, you could take dots in the shape of the letters, and then when you erase the dots, you actually get kind of a hidden version of that. Uh, the letter's still there. They, these uniquely reconstruct to a set of points um, that have the text in them, but you get nice tessellations out of it. And a recent idea is instead of thinking of these as isolated Voronoi diagrams, one for each letter, you can just put all those points into one big diagram and get, you can still see the text, uh, as, at least when as much as you could before. Um, and so you can take any text here, for example, is just XOXOXO alternating, and you get a cool tessellation out of it. Um, or here you see uh, a point set that clearly says, uh, describes this piece itself, generative art made by Voronoi diagrams. And then this is the Voronoi diagram that you get where you can't see that text, but it looks cool. Okay, but what about coloring? This looks, looks sort of like stained glass. So if we color in uh, these cells randomly, uh, if we don't color in the cells of the letters, then you can see the letters very clearly. So this is just the alphabet. Or uh, if you do color in the cells, this may be not so obvious. Uh, so if you stare at this long enough, you might see uh, Voronoi algorithm computation and its reflection, again, kind of self-describing. 
Uh, here we're illustrating, this says compute around the sides. And here we're illustrating the growth process of growing circles to make the Voronoi diagram. The black is the Voronoi diagram and the circles are, are the growth circles. Uh, or you can do it alternating black and white, uh, which is pretty hypnotizing. Here you can't really see the text. Or if we make the dots in the shape of the text, the inverse font, then we get another kind of hypnotizing spider web. And lately we've been looking at taking these growth diagrams and actually building them out of sheets of paper. So here, for example, we're laser cutting lots of sheets, stacking them up and getting, uh, here we have ART, art. Um, and here's a even more three-dimensional version uh, made out of foam core. So that's what we've been playing with lately. Still many more fonts in process and to come and maybe in a few more years, I'll give you another update. Um, I talked a lot about hardness proofs, which is a class I'm teaching right now. Uh, at MIT. Uh, all the videos are freely available online. There's a couple of new ones, so if you want to hear the latest about hardness proofs, uh, watch lectures 6 and 11 online at this class. And there's a new book uh, on this topic uh, that's also freely available and is currently in draft form, but will appear next year. And that's it. Thank you.